Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and joyful feast of unleavened bread to you all. G. Stephen Simons here. I'm so glad you could join me for this home worship video resource. It is my sincere desire that you are having a tremendously blessed and deeply meaningful feast of unleavened bread. And I just wanted to take a moment and give you an update on where we are in the spring appointed times and tell you about some video premiere events that we have planned, y'all willing, for the days ahead. When this video comes out, it will be the fourth day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It will also be the weekly Sabbath within the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the scripture says, on the morrow after the Sabbath, our understanding is that it is the weekly Sabbath within the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So on the next day is the day of the wave sheaf offering, when the children of Israel would bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the barley harvest to the priest who would wave it before Yah to be accepted. And then they could go back and enjoy the rest of the barley harvest, as well as all the other harvests that come in throughout the year, knowing that the Father has placed his hand of blessing upon their harvests. Now, this day is a very, very special and important day for believers in Messiah, because it is the day when Yeshua presented himself alive to the Father after his resurrection. He is the first fruit of the resurrection. And so we want to host a video premiere on the morning of the day of the wave sheaf offering, which is the morning of 428 at 11 a.m. Central Time, which is noon Eastern Time and is 9 a.m. Pacific Time. And we want to talk about how Yeshua fulfilled the Wave Sheaf Offering. It's going to be a wonderful time, and I hope to see all of you there. We also want to host a video premiere on the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the last day, and we want to bring the Feast of Unleavened Bread to a conclusion in a wonderful way of fellowship and worship and study in the Word. And so this video premiere will be hosted on the evening of 429 at 8.30 p.m. Central Time. That's 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time and 6.30 p.m. Pacific Time. So we want to invite you all to come and let's celebrate the ending of the Feast of Unleavened Bread together in fellowship and in worship and in study. All right, it is time to blast our shafars. I hope you have your shafar. And when we come back in the next segment, we will sound the alarm to Teshuvah together. All right, family, are you ready to quote the Shema? We'll place the verses right up on your screen. We're going to begin with Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. And first we're going to say it in Hebrew, and then we'll say it in English. Let's say it together. Shema Israel, Ya Eloheinu, Ya Echad. Hero Israel, Ya are Elohim, Ya is one. And you shall love Yah, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And then we go to the second Shema found in Torah, which is Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning with verse 18. Let's say it together. I shall raise up for them a prophet like you out of the midst of their brothers, and I shall put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. 
and it shall be the man who does not listen to my words which he speaks in my name I require it of him and then we go to Ezekiel chapter 36 beginning with verse 25 let's say it together and I shall sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols I cleanse you and I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I shall take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I shall give you a heart of flesh and put my spirit within you and I shall cause you to walk in my laws and guard my right rulings and you shall do them. Hallelujah. With all the anti-Semitism and hatred of the Jewish people and the violence being perpetrated against the Jews, not only in the land of Israel, but worldwide, we need to stand in the gap to pray and intercede on behalf of the Jewish people for their safety, for their protection, for their well-being, and for their salvation. We're also going to be praying for the nations of the world, and we're going to be praying for our gatherings, wherever we may be meeting, worldwide. Let's pray. Abba, we bless you, we praise you, we worship you and adore you. There is none like you. We thank you for this wonderful set-apart Shabbat day where we can gather as your people by way of video and fellowship with one another and worship you together and study your word. And we're thankful for the many blessings that you pour out upon your people. We're thankful for the rest. We're thankful for the shalom. We're thankful for the joy. And we ask that all that we do and all that we say will bring great esteem to you in the name of your son, Yeshua. We're facing the land of Israel. Our hearts are with the land and with its people. And we pray for the Jewish people living in the land that you would protect them, that you would keep them safe. We're asking that you would give guidance to those who are making decisions in the land. We're asking that you would keep the innocent ones safe. We're praying for the release of the hostages. And we're praying for the shalom of Yerushalayim. We're asking that this war would come to a speedy end. And we pray that shalom would be restored to the land. We're also praying for the Jewish people worldwide. We're praying against the hatred and the violence. And we're praying your hand of protection will be upon the Jewish people wherever they may be. We're asking you to reveal yourself and your son Yeshua to the Jewish people, both in the land and in the nations. And we're praying that as they read through the scripture, that you would show them Yeshua by revelation, that they would see Yeshua and be convicted and call upon that one name by which we all must be saved, the name Yeshua, to receive a justification that leads to true Torah obedience. We're also praying for the citizens of the land of Israel. And we're asking you to move powerfully by your Ruach in the land and that many many, many Jewish people and citizens of the land of Israel would come to see Yeshua and believe upon Him as Master and Mashiach of Israel and receive a justification through belief that leads to true Torah obedience. 
We're praying the same for the Jewish people who live in the nations. That you would reveal the true Mashiach of Israel to the Jewish people wherever they live worldwide. And that many would come to know him, Yeshua, as the Mashiach, the son of Elohim. We're praying for the ingathering of Ephraim out of every nation under heaven. And we're praying that you will move powerfully by your Ruach in the nations, that you would anoint this ministry and anoint these videos as they go out across the world each week. And that many people would push play and watch the videos and hear the messages. And that you would bring conviction by your Ruach HaKodesh. And that many, many people in the nations would believe upon Yeshua with a belief that produces obedience to the commandments and receive justification and be grafted in to believing Israel to participate in the covenant with Elohim, with you, Father, through Yeshua and his shed blood. We're also praying for our gatherings. We know that you know every need of every person in the gatherings. And we're asking you to do what you can do in our midst, the supernatural. We're asking you to meet the needs of your people, to lift the fallen, to encourage the downcast, to heal the sick. We're asking you to do the miraculous. Bless your people as we lift up set apart hands and pray to you and worship you and bless you. Thank you for being a covenant maker and a covenant keeper and for being trustworthy within the context of the covenant to hear your people's prayers and to fulfill your promises as we have a belief in Yeshua that produces obedience. I pray that everything that we do and say today in our gatherings and on this wonderful, beautiful set-apart Shabbat day will bring great esteem to you in the name of your Son, Yeshua. And I pray that we would welcome greater empowerment to go forth in strength and boldness and proclaim Yeshua and Teshuvah everywhere we go in our world. And we pray that you will be blessed by our worship of you and our ministering to you and all these things we ask in the name of your Son and our Master and Mashiach, Yeshua. Amen and Amen. I want to share a wonderful passage of Scripture that is so appropriate for this Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread season that we're in. It's Isaiah 53. And as I read the entire chapter, allow it to inspire you to worship. Who has believed our report? And to whom was the arm of Yah revealed? For he grew up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or splendor that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should desire him. Despised and rejected by men, a man of pains and knowing sickness, and as one from whom the face is hidden, being despised, 
and we did not consider him. Truly, he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Yet we reckoned him smitten, stricken by Elohim, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our crookednesses. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. We all like sheep went astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. And Yah has laid on him the crookedness of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. But he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, but he did not open his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and as for his generation, who considered that he shall be cut off from the land of the living? For the transgression of my people he was stricken, and he was appointed a burial site with the wrong and with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was deceit in his mouth. But Yah was pleased to crush him. He laid sickness on him, that when he made himself an offering for guilt, he would see a seed. He would prolong his days, and the pleasure of Yah prosper in his hand. He would see the result of the suffering of his life and be satisfied. Through his knowledge, my righteous servant makes many righteous, and he bears their crookednesses. Therefore I give him a portion among the great, and he divides the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his being unto death, and he was counted with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors.
falling down my beard Running down my garments All right, it's time for prayer. And I want to take you over to John chapter 15, and we're going to read verse 16. This is Yeshua speaking. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he might give you. And so I see here Yeshua linking fruitfulness to answered prayer. He's saying you should go and you should do and you should be fruitful and you should accomplish the work that I've given you to accomplish. And if you'll do that, then the Father will hear and answer your prayers. He's linking fruitfulness to answered prayer. I find another example of that over in Acts chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. It says, Now there was a certain man in Cahisaria called Cornelius, a captain of what was called the Italian regiment, dedicated and fearing Elohim with all his household, doing many kind deeds to the people, that's fruitfulness, and praying to Elohim always. So we see the link between fruitfulness and prayer. He clearly saw in a vision about the ninth hour of the day, a messenger of Elohim coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius, and looking intently at him, and becoming afraid, he said, What is it, Master? And he said to him, Your prayers and your kind deeds have come up for remembrance before Elohim. Because this man had been actively involved in blessing the Jewish people, he was fruitful, he was bearing much fruit. Then when he prayed, the father had an open ear to his prayers and sent a messenger to bring the answer to prayer. And so I want to encourage you. Are you being fruitful? Are you actively involved in the expansion of the reign of Elohim? Are you doing the work of Yeshua in the earth? If you are, then the father will hear and answer your prayers. But if you're lacking in this, then you need to begin putting the expansion of the reign of Elohim, the work of the ministry, as a priority in your life. Get active in these things. Actively going or actively sending. And if you'll do these things, then you can know the Father will hear and answer prayer because Yeshua linked fruitfulness to answered prayer. Keep these things in mind, and y'all bless you as you pray.
want to encourage you in your giving and take you over to Leviticus chapter 23. And we're going to begin with verse nine. It says this, and Yah spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel and you shall say to them, when you come into the land, which I give you and shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest and he shall wave the sheaf before Yah for your acceptance. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest waves it. Verse 14. And you do not eat bread or roasted grain or fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your Elohim, a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And so Yah is saying before you eat of this barley harvest, before you eat fresh grain or roasted grain or anything that comes from this first harvest that takes place in the first month of the new biblical year, then you are to bring to me the first portion of this first harvest. And the priest is to wave it before me to be accepted. And once you've completed that, then you can eat of the barley harvest and every other harvest that takes place throughout the year. Yah wants to know that his people see him as provider. That he's the one who gave the land, that he's the one who brought the harvest, that he's the one who brings the rain, that he's the one who brings the blessing. And so giving is a very important aspect of walking in covenant with Yah. He wants to see that his people will obey him to bring in the first portion of what Yah is going to bless them with throughout the year. Now, these people were very connected to the land. They grew their own food. But in modern times, people aren't as connected to the land. They go to work. They go to jobs. They get paychecks. And they purchase their food and what they need from the money that they receive from their jobs. So if we're to apply the same principle to modern times, we would say that the wave sheaf offering is a financial offering. And it's bringing the first portion of what we expect Yah to bless us with throughout the year. And we're showing Yah that we believe that he is our provider, that he is our source, that man is not our source, that our job is not our source, that our income is not our source, but that we look to Yah to be our source. And we're bringing the first portion of what he will bless us with throughout the year. Now, when do we bring it in? We bring it in on the morrow after the Sabbath, after the weekly Sabbath in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so when this video comes out, it will be the Sabbath. So the next day is when you bring it in. Now, if you have a local congregation, then I would encourage you to take your first fruits offering to your local congregation. If you do not, then bring it in to a ministry that is blessing you and doing the work. Here at Triumph and Truth Ministries, we are going from place to place and from state to state. We are proclaiming Yeshua and Teshuvah. We are water immersing scores and scores of people. We are empowering people through the teaching of the word and through water immersion to receive the I want to obey heart and the power to be obedient. We are doing the work. And so on this day, on the Sabbath, I would say, be consistent in your tithes and offerings. But I want to encourage you to have an offering that you can bring to Yah on the day of the wave sheaf offering that shows your trust in Him, that He's your provider and that He will bless you and that you want His hand of blessing on you, on your family, on your work, on your job, on your income, 
and on your increase, and you bring in that offering and expect the blessing to be on your life. Keep these things in mind, and y'all bless you in your giving. Are you ready to get into y'all's word? I am as well. I want you to open your Bibles with me, if you will, to Leviticus chapter 23, and we're going to pick up with verse 9 in just a moment. And the title of my message is Yom HaBikarim, How Yeshua Fulfilled the Wave Sheaf Offering. All right, let's get right into the verses. It says, And Yah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. I want to encourage you, when you read that in the Bible, you need to realize that you are a part of believing Israel. And so when Yah speaks to Moshe and tells Moshe to speak to the children of Israel, your ears ought to perk up because Elohim is about to say something to you. Speak to the children of Israel and you shall say to them, when you come into the land which I give you, and shall reap its harvest. This is talking about the barley harvest. The barley harvest is the first harvest of the year. When you come into the land which I give you, Yah says here, and shall reap its harvest. You're ready to bring in the barley. Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. So you're to go out and you are to harvest a certain portion, a sheaf of your first fruits of the barley harvest. So you bring the first portion to Yah. You bring it to the priest, it says. And what's the priest going to do? And he shall wave the sheaf before Yah for your acceptance. You have to be accepted before you can enjoy the barley harvest. You have to be accepted before you can then enjoy the wheat harvest. That's to come a bit later. And all of the harvests of the year, you must be accepted. So you have to bring the first portion of the barley harvest. That's the first harvest of the year. So it's the first of the first. And you bring it to the priest and the priest waves it before Yah. And by waving it before Yah and by that Israelite bringing it to the priest, that Israelite is declaring and proclaiming that Yah is his source. Yah is his provider. Yah is the one who will send the goodness and the blessings. Yah is the one who takes care of me and will bless me. And by doing that, when it's done with the proper heart, then Yah says, I accept you. I accept you and I'm going to bless the rest of the harvest. So when you bring the first portion of the first harvest to Yah, and you declare his goodness, you declare that he is your provider, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, that he will honor your obedience, that he will bless you, that he will pour out his favor on you, that he will meet the needs of your family. When you do that, then Yah accepts you and he puts his hand of blessing on you and he begins to pour out his favor upon you. And what begins to take place is that his favor begins to work in your life to produce all that you need And you can then begin to enjoy the harvest. You can begin to enjoy the barley harvest. And then you're prepared to enjoy the wheat harvest and all the other harvests that are to come. It's something that takes place at the beginning of the year with an anticipation that Yah is going to bless you. He shall wave the sheaf before Yah, it says, for your acceptance. Notice, it's on the morrow after the Sabbath the priest waves it. All right, this is talking about the morrow after the weekly Sabbath. So we've just enjoyed the weekly Sabbath when the sun goes down. It's probably setting about now. Then we start a new day. And it is the morrow after the weekly Sabbath. So Yom HaBikarim, 
or the day of the wave sheaf offering always falls on the first day of the week. It always falls on the first day of the week. So it's on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest waves it. And on that day when you wave the sheaf, you shall prepare a male lamb, a year old. Now all of these sacrifices, all of these offerings point to Yeshua. When you read in Leviticus about the offerings, many people get all bogged down and they don't, they don't know why they should read all that. They don't know how it relates. Listen, when you understand that all of those sacrifices and all of those offerings point to Yeshua, then Leviticus is the most exciting book in the Bible because you see Yeshua everywhere. And so on that day, Yom HaBikari, when you wave the sheaf, you shall prepare a male lamb, a year old, a perfect one. Doesn't that point to Yeshua? As an ascending offering to Yah. An ascending offering is a whole burnt offering. The entire animal is consumed in fire. And that points to Yeshua because Yeshua gave himself to Yah completely. Spirit, being, and physical body. He held nothing back from the Father. He submitted himself completely to the Father. He was the most submitted person on the planet, and yet he walked in the greatest degree of power. That's the power of submission. He said, I don't even speak my own words. I just speak the words of my Father, the one who sent me. I don't do my own work. I do the works of him who sent me. I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do the will of my Father. And Yeshua left an example to us. If we want to walk in power, we have to learn to walk in submission. We have to offer ourselves up as an ascending offering. Follow in Yeshua's footsteps. Give yourself wholly, that's completely, to Abba Spirit, being, and physical body. And then it says in verse 13, and it's grain offering, so there's a grain offering, two tenths of an ephah of fine flour. Well, for it to be fine flour, the grain has to be broken open. It has to be crushed. And this speaks of Yeshua's sacrifice when he was crushed for the sins of the world. It says two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil. The oil speaks of the anointing of the set apart spirit. Yah anointed Yeshua. He placed his spirit. The spirit is the spirit of the father. Let's get that clear. The set apart spirit is the Father's spirit. The Father puts his spirit upon whomever he wants. If you're anointed of the spirit, that means the Father has placed his spirit on you. You can't help but be like the Father when you have his spirit on you. And the scripture says the spirit of Yah is the set apart spirit. When you get the set apart spirit on you, what's going to happen to you? You're going to become set apart. People that want to talk about, oh, I'm just filled with the spirit, but you look at their lives and there's a whole lot of world there. So when you really get filled with the spirit, the set apart spirit, you become set apart. It says an offering made by fire to Yah, a sweet fragrance and it's drink offering one fourth of a hen of wine the wine speaks of the blood of Yeshua the blood of the the new covenant and you do not eat bread or roasted grain or fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your Elohim, a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So you don't get to eat fresh bread made of this new harvest. You don't get to eat roasted grain of the new harvest. You don't get to eat fresh grain of the new harvest until you have brought your wave sheaf offering. Only then can you begin to enjoy 
the goodness of Yah for that year. Now this is a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And so we need to realize that this wave sheaf offering determines everything else that happens in the year. We're going to keep reading and I'm going to show you where we begin counting 50 days starting on Yom HaBikarim. So Yom HaBikarim is a time clock in essence. And without you engaging, without you bringing that offering, you're lost as it relates to what Yah is wanting to do. The wheat harvest depends upon that first fruits offering of the barley. The harvest that comes in during Sukkot depends upon Yom HaBikarim and the wave sheep offering. Everything that happens in the future depends upon Yom HaBikarim and the wave sheaf offering. And I'm going to show you in just a moment why that's so tremendously important. Look at verse 15. And from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, you shall count for yourselves seven completed Sabbaths. So seven completed Sabbaths is how many days? 49 days, seven times seven. Until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you count 50 days. We're talking about Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks. You may say in your English Bible, Pentecost, 50 days is what that means. So that countdown starts on Yom HaBikarim when you bring in your offering to be accepted. Then you can start enjoying the fresh grain of the barley harvest and you can look forward to with great anticipation the harvest that are to come. Until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath you count 50 days then you shall bring a new grain offering to Yah. So you're going to bring a, a new grain offering. It's the wheat grain offering. All right, and what is it? This is really important. I want you to start wrapping your spirit around these words that I'm saying because I'm going to apply it to Yeshua and how he has fulfilled the wave sheaf offering and what's to come in the future and the harvest. When we talk about harvest, what do we think about? We think about people. The harvest that's to come in depends on the wave sheaf offering being completed. And we're talking about Yeshua fulfilling it. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself there. So what is the new grain offering to Yah that you bring during Shavuot? Bring from your dwellings for a wave offering. Again, it's going to be waved before Yah. Two loaves of bread. Two loaves of bread. The original whole wheat. Of two tenths of an ephah of fine flour, they are baked with leaven, first fruits to Yah. Two loaves of bread. What symbolism is there? What could that mean? Well, two loaves of bread. We're talking about a harvest of people. We're talking about people entering into the new covenant in Yeshua's blood, what could two loaves of bread symbolize? How about the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda? See, for you to enter into the new covenant, you have to be grafted in to believing Israel. And the whole house of Israel consists of the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda. So, when your wave sheaf offering is accepted and you start counting and you get to 50 days and it's Shavuot and you bring in your two loaves of bread, then that is symbolizing the harvest that's before us. We're going to read some verses here where Yeshua talks to us about 
Don't say there's four months and then comes the harvest. He says the harvest is already white. Go out and get it. All right? And so we see the two loaves of bread, the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda. And we're reminding Yah as the bread is waved of the harvest that is to come and that when we believe in Yeshua, we're grafted in. We don't become a part of a Roman rooted Gentile church. That's religion, folks. I'm not saying that there's not sincere people in religion. You can be sincere, but sincerely wrong about some things. If you want to be a part of the new covenant in Yeshua's blood, you have to be a part of the house of Israel or the house of Yehuda. You have to be a part of believing Israel. And when you believe upon Yeshua, you are grafted in. Hallelujah. And so go with me over to John chapter 12. And we're going to look at verse 24. And we're going to talk more about how Yeshua fulfilled the wave sheaf offering in his resurrection. Yeshua says here, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He's likening himself to a seed. And he's saying, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. If you take a seed and you don't plant it, what do you have? A seed, a lonely seed. It's all by itself. That's all you have is a seed. But if it falls to the ground and dies, in other words, if you plant it, it's one of the most wonderful miracles of Elohim. If you plant a seed, there's, there's resurrection life in that seed. If you put it in the ground, it's gonna get resurrected. In other words, it's going to come back to life. It looks like it's dead and you bury it. But it's going to come up out of the grave. And when it comes out of the grave, it's going to produce multiple heads of grain, multiple heads of seed. And so Yeshua said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, he's speaking of himself, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. It's going to produce a harvest. There's a harvest coming. In other words, because of what Yeshua did as the Passover lamb, he took the sin of the world upon himself. He died in our place. He suffered our judgment. He paid our death penalty. Then the unleavened one, the sinless one, took the leaven of the world upon himself and became leavened. He died on the stake, was taken down and put in a tomb and they rolled a large stone over the tomb door and sealed it. In essence, Yah took the leaven of the world and got it out of his creation. Just like you get the leaven out of your house. And that's Yeshua the seed. Dying and being planted. And he says, if I die and I'm planted, I'm gonna produce a harvest. There's going to come a harvest after me. Just like there's a harvest after the barley harvest. There's a wheat harvest, and what does the wheat harvest represent? People, nations. There's a harvest coming, Yeshua is saying. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 6. Shaul is writing here, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the entire lump? A little sin will go through a body very quickly. A little leaven leavens the entire lump. What is he doing? Using festival terminology. People want to say that Shaul 
was anti-Torah. That he abolished the Torah. That he stopped worshiping on Shabbat and changed the seventh day Shabbat to the first day. That he no longer supported the feast that we read about in Leviticus 23. And yet here he is explaining the dynamic of sin. And what is he using? Festival terminology. Therefore, cleanse out the old leaven. Get the leaven out so that you are a new lump. As you are unleavened, you are positionally unleavened because of what Yeshua did. He took the leaven of the world upon himself and Yah removed the leaven of his creation, put it on his son and buried it. Hallelujah. So that all who would believe upon Yeshua could become unleavened. If you believe you are positionally unleavened. You say, what does that mean, positionally unleavened? That means that every resource of heaven is available to you to walk as an unleavened individual. Now, whether you take advantage of that or not is up to you. But positionally, as a believer, you have been made unleavened. Walk in it. Notice, for also Messiah, our Pesah, or our Passover lamb, was slaughtered for us. You would think that if Shaul was wanting to abolish the festivals, he wouldn't be talking about Messiah as the Pesah. Verse 8, so then let us celebrate the festival. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What festival is he talking about? This is Shaul saying, let us as believers celebrate the festival. He's talking about Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Not with old leaven. Get the leaven out. Get the leaven out of your house and get the leaven out of your life. Nor with the leaven of evil and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so Yeshua was the Pesach. He is the Pesach. Our Passover lamb. He is the unleavened one who took the leaven of the world upon himself so that through belief in him we might become unleavened. And we're going to see that he's also the fulfillment of Yom HaBikarim. He's the fulfillment of the wave sheaf offering. Let's read a little bit in the good news account of Luke concerning the resurrection. Now, if you want the whole story, you have to read all the good news accounts. And you, you kind of have to be a detective and you kind of have to piece it together. But we're going to take Luke today for our purposes here. Luke 24, starting with verse 1. But on day one of the week. Uh, by the way, what is the day that Yom HaBikarim falls on? It's the day after the weekly Sabbath, right? the first day of the week. But on day one of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. This is speaking of the women who followed Yeshua. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. In the good news account of Matthew, it says that there was a great earthquake and a messenger from Elohim came and rolled the stone back and sat upon it. Something to keep in mind, the messenger didn't roll the stone away to allow Yeshua to get out. He rolled the stone away to allow the witnesses to get in. Think about that, because it's the fact, it's the truth. Verse three, and having entered, they did not find the body of the master Yeshua. And it came to be as they were perplexed about this, that see, two men stood by them in glittering garments and becoming frightened and bowing their faces to the earth. These said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has been raised up. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galil, 
in the Galilee, saying the son of Adam has to be delivered into the hands of sinners and be impaled and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and having returned from the tomb, they reported all this to the 11 and to all the rest. And it was Miriam from Magdala and Johanna and Miriam, the mother of Jacob, and the rest with them who told this to the emissaries. And their words appeared to them to be nonsense. And they did not believe them. Don't be discouraged when you start preaching the truth, telling your family members about Yeshua and his Torah lifestyle, and they look at you like you're speaking nonsense. These women were the first witnesses of Yeshua. And you would think they were preaching to a crowd that would listen. And yet they were considered to be people speaking nonsense. Verse 12, but Kepha rose and ran to the tomb and stooping down, he saw the linen wrappings lying by themselves and he went away home marveling at what took place. Go with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to pick up with verse 12. And I'm going to start tying all of this together. Yeshua was raised as the first fruits from the dead. Remember, the wave sheaf offering is a first fruits offering. It was to be offered on the day following the weekly Sabbath. And so we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 12, and if Messiah is proclaimed that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So if we're preaching to you that Messiah has been raised, how can you say there's no resurrection from the dead? And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Messiah has not been raised. So what happens if Messiah has not been raised? The wave sheaf offering has not been accepted. There's no coming harvest. The world is lost and cannot be saved. Everything depends upon Yeshua being raised from the dead. Every other harvest is contingent upon the wave sheaf offering being made and accepted. You can't even begin to count to Shavuot without Yeshua being raised from the dead. Everything is contingent upon the master coming out of the tomb. Verse 14, and if Messiah has not been raised, then our proclaiming is empty. It means nothing. And your belief also empty. And we are also found false witnesses of Elohim because we have witnessed of Elohim that he raised up Messiah whom he did not raise up if then the dead are not raised. Don't think for a second that Shaul doesn't understand these principles that I'm sharing with you. We already read a passage where he was calling the Messiah the Pesah, the Passover lamb, where he used festival terminology, leavened and unleavened. And now he is relating to what he understands about the wave sheaf offering. If that offering is not made, if that offering is not accepted, then we have nothing. Our preaching is empty. We're still in our sins. We're lost and without hope. Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, then neither Messiah has been raised. And if Messiah has not been raised, your belief is to no purpose. 
You are still in your sins. Because Yeshua is the fulfillment of the wave sheaf offering. Everything is contingent upon that offering. Verse 18. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Messiah have perished. If in this life only we have expectation in Messiah, in other words, if this is all just made up and we're just fooling ourselves, we are of all men the most wretched. Look at verse 20. But now... Messiah has been raised from the dead. Notice, and has become the first fruit of those having fallen asleep. He is the first fruits of those who have died. He's the first in the resurrection. He won't be the last. He has made a way through death and the tomb. And he's leading us to life. For since death is through a man, speaking of Adam, resurrection of the dead is also through a man, Yeshua. For as all die in Adam, so also all shall be made alive in Messiah. And each in his own order. Messiah the firstfruits, then those who are of Messiah at his coming. Yah raised Messiah from the dead. Yeshua could not be held down. And even though the dark kingdom, Hasatan, and demon forces celebrated what they thought was a victory, they had no idea Yah's plan. And I'm going to share with you a verse in a moment that says exactly that. Go with me over to Colossians chapter 1, and we'll pick up with verse 18. And he, Yeshua, is the head of the body, the assembly, who is the beginning. Notice, the firstborn from the dead. Well, if you are in a family and there's a firstborn, it implies that there are others. If you say, this is my firstborn, you're typically implying that there are others. And Yeshua is the firstborn from the dead. Notice that he might become the one who is first in all. He is first in all. He is the wave sheaf offering. It is the first fruits of the first harvest of the year. He is first in all. And our salvation is dependent upon the wave sheaf offering being made and accepted. So we've been sharing with you scriptures that tell us that Messiah has become the first fruit of those having fallen asleep. Let's look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. Because those whom he knew beforehand, he also ordained beforehand to be conformed to the likeness of his son. For him to be the firstborn, notice, among many brothers. Why would you follow Yeshua? He's the only one who made it out of the tomb alive, never to die again. He was resurrected with an exalted physical body that was transformed that would never die again. Why would you follow him? Because you want the same body. You don't want the grave to hold you down. Why would you follow Yeshua? Yeshua said, follow me. What was he thinking when he said that? Follow me and I'll lead you to the Father. He's the only one who made it to the right hand. Why would you follow him? Because you want to make it to the Father as well. 
And then Romans chapter six, starting with verse four. We were therefore buried with him through immersion into death. So we joined into his death. We were buried with him through immersion that as Messiah was raised from the dead by the esteem of the Father. He was raised from the dead by the esteem of the Father. So also we should walk in newness of life. For if we have come to be grown together in the likeness of his death, if you've joined with him in his death, we shall be also of the resurrection. We're gonna also follow him in the resurrection. Now that is our consolation. You think about how difficult life can be. Trials and tribulations and pressures and persecutions. But when you know that by believing in Yeshua, he's the ultimate overcomer and he's going to cause you to overcome and death and the grave will not hold you down and you're going to be resurrected as well. You're gonna follow him. You're going to follow him to the right hand of the Father. In essence, he'll lead you right to the Father. Yes, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14 says, Knowing that he who raised up the Master Yeshua shall also raise us up through Yeshua. That is something that we need to know. Knowing that he who raised up the Master Yeshua, speaking of Elohim, shall also raise us up through Yeshua. After watching this video, you may have been convicted in your heart and you're asking yourself the question, what must I do to be saved? Well, the Bible tells us that there are some things that we must do to be saved. And so I wanna give you seven things according to scripture that we must be willing to do to walk the path to salvation. The first thing is we must believe with all of our hearts that Yeshua Messiah is the son of the living Elohim, that he died on the tree for our sins, that he was buried and raised from the dead. And then we must perform teshuvah. The word teshuvah is a Hebrew word that means to turn to the master in obedience. It's not just enough to say, I'm sorry for what I did in the past. I'm sorry for my sins. But instead, you leave behind your lifestyle of sin and you embrace the word of Yah and you have a willingness and a desire then to be obedient to the commandments. And then thirdly, you must submit yourself to water immersion. When you're immersed in water, the Bible says that you are buried with Yeshua Messiah and you are raised to walk in newness of life. The scripture says that old lifestyle of sin is cut away from your life. And it's the place where the circumcision of Messiah takes place. That's the circumcision of the heart. And you receive the want to heart. In other words, you want to obey. And then that leads us to number four. You also receive the power to be obedient. And how do you do that? You pray to be filled with the set apart spirit of Yah. And so when you're filled with the spirit of Yah or you're immersed in the spirit of Yah, not only are you given the power to be successful within the context of the covenant and to love Yah the way Yah wants to be loved through obedience, but you're also empowered you're given gifts of the Spirit. You're empowered by Yah to be useful for the reign of Elohim and to go out and to receive that harvest of humanity that Yeshua has charged all of his followers to go out and receive. And then we need to read our Bibles regularly and pray continually. The scripture says the word of Yah is like milk for a baby. And so if you're just coming to belief, it's like you're a little infant in your belief and you need to grow. How are you going to grow? You need to eat. And what do you eat? You eat the word. It's like milk for a baby. So eat regularly in the word and pray continually, the scripture says. Isn't it wonderful that you have a relationship with the father and now you can have an ongoing conversation with the father? That's a beautiful thing. And then number six, you need to find a local fellowship that you can engage with. If you can't find a local fellowship, then get connected 
with a ministry that's blessing you and then stay connected. And then number seven, the scripture says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. What that tells us is that salvation is not just a moment. It's not just a prayer, but instead it's a life. And so you have to live this life of walking in the will of the Father, walking in His ways, following after Yeshua and His example of obedience, loving the Word, obeying the commandments, praying, and being filled with the Spirit of Yah, being led by the Spirit of Yah. And if you'll do that throughout your life, the Scripture says when you get to the end of your life, you will be saved. And so I want to encourage you, once you start, don't quit, don't give out, don't give in, don't back up. Continue in this walk, and if you'll do it and not stop, then at the end of your life or when Yeshua returns, you will be saved. And so I want to encourage you, if you are ready to make a commitment to these things, then why don't you send us an email at info at triumphandtruth.global, and we're going to respond right back to you, and we're going to celebrate with you the fact that you have believed upon Yeshua and you're ready to walk in Yeshua's example of obedience, walk in a lifestyle that pleases the Master, and we want to encourage you in it. And so send us an email. We want to celebrate with you. If you endure to the end, the Scripture says, you will be saved. Hallelujah. Did you receive a blessing by watching this video? Well, if you did, I want to encourage you to be a blessing by sharing this video with your family and friends. As we bring this home worship video to a conclusion, I want to speak a word of blessing over your life. So I want to invite you to stand up where you are, lift up your hands and begin to worship as I speak these words of blessing over you. Yah bless you and guard you. Yah make his face shine upon you and show favor to you. Yah lift up his face upon you and give you Shalom. In Yeshua's name, Amen and Amen.